Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to CIO Leadership Live. I'm your host, Mary Fran Johnson, CEO of Mary Fran Johnson Media and a contributing writer on CIO.com, where I contribute on boardroom and career strategies for technology leaders. Our sponsor for today's episode is Fairfax County, Virginia's Economic Development Authority. Innovation and opportunity for all is what Fairfax County has to offer, and you're invited to start, relocate, or expand your business in this global tech community that is located just outside Washington, D.C. It is a corporate community that's accomplishing mission-critical work and making the world a better place. To learn more, go to fairfaxcountyeda.org. We're streaming to you now on both LinkedIn and YouTube, and we welcome our viewers to join in today's conversation with questions of your own. Our editors will be watching for those questions and doing their best to uh, extend them along to today's guest, who I'm very pleased to uh, welcome is David Reese. He is the Chief Information Officer for the University of Miami Health System. As South Florida's only university-based medical system, UHealth is the teaching hospital affiliated with the University of Miami's Miller School of Medicine. It employs more than 1,800 healthcare providers, scientists, and researchers. Technology is very strategic for UHealth, especially in areas of clinical workflow and consumer and patient engagement, which you'll hear David and I talking a lot about today. One of the most recent accomplishments for David and his team was winning a CIO 100 award this year for innovation. This is the second year in a row that the team has brought this award home. And this time it was for a public outreach project that automated the distribution and administration of vaccines in the Miami area. Before making his move south in 2020, David served as the CIO at Hackensack Meridian Medical Center in New Jersey. And prior to that, he was the CIO at Leahy Health in the Boston area here, after spending a number of years in the chief security officer position, both at Leahy and then before that at Jefferson Health in Philadelphia. And no, he doesn't miss our New England weather even a little bit. David, it's so nice to have you here today. How are things in sunny Florida? You're fantastic, Mary Fran. Good to see you. Yes, you too. Let's dive in and talk about health, the healthcare IT industry and how it has, how things have been going in one of the most disruptive periods that probably any of us can even remember. How have your own digital business models been advancing in this past year or more to meet those kind of challenges? We've had a number of exciting kind of developments and changes in our business processes, both clinically and operationally over the course of the, the last 18 months, 24 months, and uh, in particular over the last six months. Um, in particular, what we've really seen is a strong adoption of digital healthcare by our uh, patient population. Uh, and happy to talk more about that. But yes. the, the adoption both of patient portals as well as in-home medical devices that are used to capture uh, telemetry data images and uh, breath sounds and then send them back to our care providers here at UHealth. That mm -hmm. has seen explosive growth um, and keen interest uh, in, our, in our populations. And so we're excited to see where we can take that technology and, and excited with what we've been able to do with it so far, which has actually helped keep um, borderline admittable patients yeah. in the home using the technology rather than having to uh, admit them into the hospital. So. It's actually mm -hmm. had a benefit in creating that capacity for us. That's just the one example. And we've been able to do the same around many of our revenue cycle and uh, business process improvements as well. Right. Well, and you pointed out uh, when we when we talked to prepare for this conversation today that this is really the time to shine in health IT. There is just so uh, the changing relationships between consumers and patients and their various medical providers all the expectations of what you can do are changing now. A couple of years ago, you wouldn't have considered sending an email or getting on a portal to talk to your doctor. And we've all adopted that behavior pretty quickly. Uh, that, that actually changes the economics for healthcare IT and the way technology has, well, as you say, it, it is the time to shine. Talk a little bit yeah. more about that. <laughs> Yeah, it is. Our, I mean, this is, this is you know, whoever would have thought it would have taken a global pandemic to advance the business models 
I mean, I yeah. think we can spend some time to talk about that. But what we really see is for a number of years, the technology has been there to bring um, remote digital health uh, to the patient where they are, to the place of choosing where they would want to receive their care and then connect them to our care providers. And I think that's really what we saw was what enabled that to happen so quickly um, during the early days of the pandemic was the changing in the business model to make sure that all that care mm -hmm. that was delivered digitally was reimbursable both from the commercial payers as well as from the, um, the government through Medicare and Medicaid. Mm -hmm. So I think what we finally saw was a quick shift in the business model and the reimbursement methods to align with the digital capabilities and the clinician's desire to deliver care yes. remotely and digitally. Um, that, that's kind of what, un, you know, it's what, that's what uncorked the capability we have now for um, consuming and receiving care digitally and, mm -hmm. and over great distance. Well, and it's, it's especially amazing, I think, because for so many years, CIOs in the healthcare IT, it seems like all the conversations were always around the big EHRs, the electronic health record systems, because they were they were kind of the ERP black hole of yeah. healthcare IT. And yeah. it just, I haven't been having as many of those conversations anymore. It's just such a different landscape, isn't it? It is. And I think we, this, what we've seen really, I think kind of even as we transition into post pandemic mm -hmm. um, is we've, we've kind of, we've, we've done what we were going to do in, in terms of ER, ER, EHR adoption and mm -hmm. in terms of kind of the big paradigm shift. Now we're actually starting to reap some of the benefits of being able to have digitized that clinical care. Mm -hmm. And so now we're talking beyond the EMR or the EHR, depending on what you'd like to call it. We're talk, we're, Beyond that, now we're actually using our digital capabilities to deliver care, receive care, provide second opinions, mm -hmm. uh, and, and help maintain health and wellness over extended periods of time. So I think we have, we will always want to focus some amount of attention, energy, and resources on continuing to optimize the EMR and continuing to um, ensure that it's mm -hmm. optimally functional and, and is really working the way the clinicians needed to. And now we're starting to pivot beyond that even and talking about what's the next methods of, of care delivery, care documentation, care yeah. consumption. Well, um, let's pursue that thought a little bit. What are some of the next levels, some of the things that you and your healthcare colleagues are thinking about now? So a well, couple of things. One, you, you have to think about AI and machine learning mm -hmm. and the using that and applying that to the vast amounts of patient data that we have to develop new therapies, to do develop, to understand clinical outcomes, and to use the data we have to come up with care pathways that we know, based upon a retrospective look back, are highly effective, um, have um, strong therapeutic benefit, mm -hmm. and um, are well tolerated by the patient. So AI and art in image processing is a big deal. Mm -hmm. Radiology studies. For us, we have the number one ranked eye hospital in the country in the Baskin Palmer Eye Institute. And they're heavily focused on how much imaging happens at the eye yeah. and how we can use artificial intelligence and machine learning to interpret what they're imaging um, and be able to make clinical care recommendations around that. So AI is a big deal. The, um, let me see. I want to I talk next about some of the strategic technology and business priorities you're setting going forward. Um, is there anything that uh, you've been almost a little two years, I guess, you've been with a little over two years? No, this is your two-year anniversary, right? This It is. This, I'm about 22 months in. Oh, congratulations. Um, did anything from when you arrived to, to now, did anything shift up or down your list when you think about the strategic priorities that you have as the CIO? Yeah. Um, one of the ones that really shot up the list and probably over the last six months is um, not so much robotic process automation. That's actually probably come down mm -hmm. almost a little bit. What's really shut up is interactive patient bots oh. and interactive um, bots for our clinicians and our, our stakeholder community to interact with the IT department. So that kind of conversational bot, be it mm -hmm. voice or text, has really quickly risen up huh. our profile and kind of really become center attention for us in a variety of areas. What's an example of what that looks like? Since that, if you don't work in a healthcare environment, the bot might that you might think, what is he talking about? So explain that. <laughs> sure. So there's a couple of, there's a couple of ways. One, 
and we actually borrowed this idea. So Miami being, um, it's the world's playground. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so the hospitality mindset, the hospitality industry is, is deeply rooted in the mindsets. Yes. Uh, here. And so one of the things, just think from a bot standpoint, is there are times you call a restaurant, you make a reservation for your favorite table at your favorite restaurant. You have no idea that you didn't talk to a human, that you were actually talking to a bot that oh, okay. scheduled a reservation for you. And so one of the things that we've been pushing forward hard on for probably the last six months is can we bring that same level of conversational bot technology to our patients who are calling us to schedule an appointment? Interesting. And if we can mm -hmm. digitally automate that conversation flow, yeah, um, that allows us to free up time for our agents who are that need to do more precise scheduling on more complex and intricate uh, patient appointment requests. So mm -hmm. we're trying to free up uh, the staff to spend more time on the detailed, intricate, nuanced appointment scheduling, right. and using the bot technology to do some of the more routine appointment Interesting. And as it's gotten more sophisticated, the patients who are calling in may not even necessarily realize they're interacting with a bot. Right. That's the goal. I, we're not there yet. We're <laughs> still in the piloting phase. So we, we haven't had first contact yet. But yeah. um, in, our, in our testing and evaluations, what I was surprised by is how many vendors there are that provide that functionality and how, mm -hmm. how mature it is already. Yeah. Um, and frankly, how deeply connected to the EMR is this? So there, there was a lot of ahas over uh, for us over the last month, month and a half. Yeah. Well, there's yeah. been, overall, there's just been so much amazing progress in healthcare IT. I can remember going a few years ago to the hospital for something, and you could go to different floors, and they would be starting all over in terms of who you were and what you were there for and that sort of thing. And that doesn't seem to happen anymore. So that, that's definitely progress. I want um, Tell us about the size and scope of your IT staff there. You have a couple of hundred people that are, are running things for the University of Miami Health System. I do. So from a size standpoint, we're uh, about 300 full-time employees within mm -hmm. the, the health IT organization. Um, and then we supplement that with another 30 or 40 contract labor, contractor consultant works that yeah. we bring in for very specific kind of short duration engagements. And then, uh, you know, in addition to that, um, we have a number of open positions within our um, business intelligence financial analysis and our um, data science departments, as well as the, the traditional positions in, in infrastructure and mm -hmm. EMR. So we have a full scale IT organization and um, we're really quickly growing our business intelligence and our data science. Areas. Yeah. Well, and I think you also mentioned to me that when you got there in 2020, it was entirely an internal staff. You weren't really making much use of contractors. You've obviously changed that. Talk about the reasoning behind that and how you approached it. Yeah, and the reason behind that is some of the more short duration projects. Mm -hmm. um, and we kind of have this, this approach and when we think about the way we, we manage the, the workflow within and the, the flow of work within the IT organization is kind of forest management. And so if we think about it, we have forest management planners who are mm -hmm. managing the projects and managing the, the full delivery of IT services. And then we have um, projects and we would think more of those as firefighters. And then we have um, a, a smaller group of those that deal with the high intensity, highest visibility projects that are of the shortest duration. And, and everyone might think about those as smoke jumpers and that continuing that forest management parlance. Mm -hmm. And so what we've seen is across all three di disciplines, we need to have strong augmentation. We need to have strong staffing. We have to have lots of institutional memory and knowledge where Mm -hmm. Not the biggest healthcare organization in the country, but we're very complicated. It's a yeah. very complex, nuanced organization. So there's no replacing um, the institutional knowledge and memory. But we have mm -hmm. seen that as we're using these kind of shifting to bleeding edge technologies, mm -hmm. we need to augment um, some of the, the workforce that we have with those that are working right at the leading, bleeding edge of technology. Yeah, and confuse that in with those that have uh, that know what the health system works, know what our patients expect, and what our, our caregivers uh, are mm -hmm. endeavoring to deliver. So, we've we've expanded that use of contract labor for very specific reasons for very short periods of time. 
Yeah. And, you know, I was thinking, too, when I was looking over um, my notes from when we last spoke, um, you were talking about the uh, incredible esprit de corps that you found when you came to the University of Miami Health System. And I, I, you know, I, I... I made note of it because so often when I've talked with CIOs, they come into a situation where they have to do a lot of repair between the IT organization and the rest of the business. Did you did you simply not have that problem when you got to the University of Miami? So there's always that element, right? There, there's yeah. always the element of you want to make sure that your stakeholder community mm-hmm. um, things as highly of your service delivery as possible. And so we focus on that. But what I mm-hmm. did see here and um, you can see over my shoulder the, the Marine Corps banner on the left. There is, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I, Marine Corps. The eight years I served in the Marine Corps, the Esprit de Corps is it is the definition of the Esprit de Corps in the Marine Corps. And I really hadn't seen that level of organizational buy-in, commitment, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. enthusiasm around an institution as I traveled through my career. When I got here to the University of Miami Health System, the Esprit de Corps um, that I did see and we still have is it doesn't reach the level of the Marine Corps for a number of reasons, but it's the closest thing I've seen to the Marine Corps um, in the 20 years since I left the Marines. So I, mm. we, we want to do everything we can do and we're purposeful in making sure we enhance that esprit de corps okay. of being part of the University of Miami Health System and the broader University of Miami uh, community overall. Mm-hmm. Uh, so trying to make sure we do everything we can do to enhance that and do a lot of listening. Mm-hmm make sure that we're um, we're building on what's good and we're, we're fixing areas where um, we can enhance things. But yeah, it's, it has been a, a really, you know, every time I think about it, it brings a smile to my face, the esprit de corps that exists here. Is yeah. Well, right. and finding a situation that good, what, what sort of, um, what sort of positive actions have you taken to make sure you continue that? What have you, what have you kind of added to the mix that has been uh, keeping that spirit alive? <laughs> I think one is to acknowledge that it exists. So the very, very ah. first thing was to label it and say, wow, this is fantastic. There mm-hmm. is a strong esprit de corps here. Let's talk about that. So that was one yeah. was to, to label and identify. And the other is we've done a couple of, couple of things. We've instituted more regular um, town hall meetings. One of my other favorite go-to strategies is coffee talks. Coffee and cups. Had, mm-hmm. Yeah, and so um, informal, no formal agenda. I'm there to listen, uh, kind of an ask me anything. Oh, but okay. I'm a, mm-hmm. I'm a big caffeine drinker, mm-hmm. uh, so do it in the mor- do those coffee talks in the morning around coffee, and and it's a way to start the day, catch people while they're thinking about their upcoming day, week, and month. And so we've instituted those monthly. Yeah. What's interesting about that is doing a coffee talk. Generally, it's in the past before we went more virtual. It was all in person, and now we've had to find a way. Okay. To do that um, through digital means, where everyone's not in the same room. Mm-hmm. We're not in the same group of rooms, and so we've continued to evolve our coffee talks. Uh, and then we have a fantastic leader that's focused on our internal communications within the IT organization and within New Health. And so mm-hmm. um, she does a great job of making sure that we continue to cultivate that as pretty important. Yeah. So those are just a couple of tidbits of ideas. Okay. Well, and are are you have you put in any? any different or special advanced collaboration technology or is this you know either microsoft teams or zoom or something like that is it are you you doing more in that area or taking advantage of what you had already so we we had team zoom and we continue to use teams and zoom Mm -hmm. uh, we've augmented that with a couple of additional technologies miro slido um, and we really found that the slido ability to do real-time polling real-time feedback has been uh, something that uh Ah. That was really liked. And we actually, we had a big EMR. We talked about EMRs earlier. We had a big EMR upgrade mm-hmm. uh, like weekends ago. Really? And wow. T- and then we had a town hall uh-huh. that went. So we did the upgrade over the weekend and we had a town hall on Wednesday. And we did a word cloud real time during the town hall, all <laughs> over Zoom using Slido to yeah. capture the spirit of the moment. And that huh. was really shocking to see people were free to put in whatever they want and then start voting as yeah. those words um, i resonated with them and it was neat to see that materialize in real time what were some of the biggest words in that cloud and tired. what and what surprised you tired yeah. <laughs> tired um that did not surprise me that mm-hmm. was that's a big effort so it, it was a triple upgrade so that was yeah. a very large multi-month upgrade so mm-hmm. tired was not surprising happy was one that did surprise me mm-hmm. we, hear so many negative headlines 
yeah bombarded with the negativity yep. and to see happy as one of the key big words that materialized in real time um i'm not sure if it was shocking or if it was gratifying mm -hmm. maybe a combination of both but that that was yeah. one that stuck with me that's great. Well, I, I don't blame you that sticking with you, you know, that sometimes we forget to ask just about some of those simple emotions. And uh, and I've had a lot more conversations with CIOs over the last two years, just about the listening skills and the empathy and, and that, you know, that whole attention. It, it seems kind of obvious now, but that attention to everyone as human beings and how they're feeling, uh, that has changed a lot. I like to think it's giving technology leaders just in general, you know, a kinder, gentler feel to them in terms of their staff. Um, let's talk about some of the uh, let's talk about some of the money stuff. We, you had brought up the unit costs of IT when yeah. we talked earlier, and we talk a lot about total cost of ownership with technology, and it's running the business of healthcare is always the focus. Has anything substantial changed about that? About the way you approach IT budgeting, or just about you know how you are able to impact the unit costs of IT? It has, and, it, and it's a it's a opposite sides of the seesaw. Mm -hmm. um, in many industries, healthcare being one of them, uh, you you tend to be in this budget cycle of either significant amounts of operating expense that you can generate, or significant amounts of, of capital expense that you can generate. And mm -hmm. so, where it gets challenging is when you're transitioning from one to the other. Okay. So, if you were used to be a heavy capital funded department, and you're moving into a more um, operating expense department or vice versa, then the, the switches can be challenging. What I've seen um, kind of over the last five years across a number of organizations is the the cloud, the move to mm -hmm. the cloud mm -hmm. has also fundamentally changed the way IT budgeting and planning happens. Yes. Traditionally, we would get lots of capital and we would spend that down. Um, and now with cloud, we're, we're operating more on the operating expense side, mm -hmm. which is you know, that's certainly fine. The challenge there is um, that becomes more of a fixed expense. And that's where the unit cost becomes so incredibly important um, because we are competing with things like training dollars, education dollars, mm -hmm. in this case, staffing dollars. So that funding the transition from a capital environment to an operating expense environment is one item that we're, we've begun to pay a significant amount of attention to here. And it's thing we're going to uh, learn how to excel at in 2023. And the idea is to bring down the unit cost Mm -hmm. how much it costs to deliver a unit, um, even if we're delivering more units. Interesting. Well, because I think you also said that, you know, there were so many years where CIOs were talking about the doing more with less, and right. everybody got so tired of that, right? That was probably right. a decade ago. But now right. you're talking about doing more with the same, right? right. Um, so, and I can't remember having that many conversations about the unit cost of IT, I, you know, it almost sounds like a digital factory model. Yeah. Um, really, I'm not overdrawing that. That's no, kind no, of you're what not like. that is, right. And I, I, I want to think that we're, my thinking there is a little on the novel side, but I think you're right. It's thinking okay. about the unit cost, um, Frederick Winslow Taylor back in the 1860s, and really mm -hmm. thinking about how to create the industrialization of digital IT delivery. Yeah. Um, and the total cost may be going up, but if we can get the unit cost under control, then we can begin to make it more of a service and a dial. Turn it up, turn it down. Yes. Demand, make it pay. The way that originally cloud and cloud storage was advertised to work. Correct. It turned out Correct. to be a little more complicated, of course, than that. But it's, yeah. it's interesting to have the funding models for IT starting to adjust to what the technologies can deliver. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's really where the next level of innovation will come from is, you know, we hear a lot about CIOs as business leaders mm -hmm. and it, that I think really is breaking down the service delivery, fully understanding the costs that go into that service delivery. Yes. And then having a demand supply conversation around how to do that well, um, whether that's for digital technology enablement, whether that's mm -hmm. for a new service line or whether that's for um, traditional break fix. Interesting. Interesting. It strikes me as the sort of thing that must make the CFOs and the CEOs of the world kind of tap their feet happily when they hear this sort of talk. 
like to think so. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want to talk also about, uh, you had mentioned the what you are kind of calibrating right now as the CIO and the technology leader is what are the maximum number of priorities that I can support? What are um, going into 22, the rest of 22 and into 23, what are the maximum priorities you can support and what are they? Right. Um, and well, yeah, and here we've had to think about that on a, a multi dimension. And so we're, we have this grid now because I think the whole idea of and there's lots of schools of thought on this. Mm -hmm. So there's one person's school of thought speaking for themselves here. But the idea of we're going to take 18,000 people, we're going to bring lots of clinical leaders, and we're going to force the organization to think about the top three priorities, mm -hmm. probably not the way forward as we think about how we're going to deliver digital enablement yeah. and increased velocity. So what we've begun to think about is broad buckets and almost like a dimension table, where for us, we have um, a tripart mission. So we have three parts of the mission, uh, research, education, and clinical care. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at those that tripart mission and saying there's probably number one priorities mm -hmm. across all three parts of the tripart mission. So that's at least three number one priorities. And then we're slicing that and saying, well, now across those three dimensions, the tripart mission, clinical education and research, and there's three number one priorities that there's multiple stakeholders within each part of that mission, clinical yeah. education. And, mm -hmm. research. and so those parties will have their number one priorities. And so you can see how we start to get from one to three to six to 20. And that's why understanding the unit costs to deliver a service or to yeah. deliver a new technology uh, becomes so critically important because then we can start having a yes question. Mm -hmm. Here's how much it costs to deliver that thing. We can complete this technology enablement project and here's the unit cost for that. And uh -huh. really always trying to align supply and demand, mm -hmm. always trying to say, if we lean forward and invest here, here's the return we're going to get. Mm -hmm. um, that's a way to, kind of get out of the one num we have one number one two number twos five number three uh, priorities that we may mm -hmm. have seen at a different phase of our careers yeah well and by the time you get to the 20 top priorities they're not priorities anymore they're just they're just a very complex matrix right. so um the uh let me see i wanted to move next to talking about well we've touched on this a little bit um the, the talent for the staff that you have, talent retention, talent acquisition. Um, right. When we talked earlier, you mentioned that you're essentially taking that, uh, Gartner made this famous a few years ago, talking about bimodal IT, where you had some of the people, some of the staff working on more leading edge and the rest of the staff, it was systems of records versus systems of new stuff happening, um, which always struck me that that would have a morale impact on employees, but you've found a way to talk about this that has been um, been better accepted. Explain that, if you would. Yeah, and I think it fits into that prior forest management conversation. With the having. smoke jumpers. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> and what we've really said is, and we again, this is listening. This is more listening mm -hmm. and less talking. Um, but what we really said is the kind of idea that Gartner made famous about bimodal is there are personality types that are more attracted to one of the two modes. Yes. And and there are comforts and self-identification of success that people will naturally gravitate to mm -hmm. in those two modes. And so the conversation really has been around ensuring through conversations, through listening. Mm hmm that we're putting people in positions to be successful and to feel self-actualized, to use a Maslow term, um, around either mode one or mode two. Okay. So trying not to say one's better or worse, one's more visible or less visible, um, but to say there's there, these are both needs, they are both strategic imperatives, mm -hmm. they both enable that tripart mission that I spoke about earlier. Now let's align your interests, skills with the needs of the organization and get a win-win. And so we've seen that natural gravitation towards either of the two modes. Yes. And that through self-selection, I think, is the best way to accomplish that. Yeah. Well, and I've, I've heard a, a, a different version of that from some years ago where CIOs used to assume that everyone on their management team was interested in being a CIO one day. And then 
discovering, you know, as, and people do that through various, through workshops and, you know, maybe they take Myers-Briggs personality tests and they come to a realization. They're like, I want to be a really leading edge individual contributor. And the last thing I want is your job. <laughs> and so that there might be some of that. We have a question from our audience and it's a really good one. David spoke of bleeding edge technology and there are often a large number of vendors such as in the chat box space but how do you filter down and find the technology or the vendors that the business really needs and wants? That is the question. That is the uh, question. It's a darn good one. Question. Yeah. And, you know, I, from my standpoint, it, it, we're never there. We'll never perfect the answer to that question. But here's, okay. some, things that, here's some things that we've done. Good. Um, one of which is we're getting real clear on what, it, what are the vendor requirements to be a partner here with the health system. Okay. So not all vendors are created equal, not all partners are created equal. Mm -hmm. And so we put some criteria around just what does it take to even be in the conversation? Yep. What size do you need to be? What scale do you need to have? What industry experience must that, that organization possess to be even in the conversation? Mm -hmm. And what we find is that that generally starts to whittle down the, the list of potential options for the technology. That's, so that's one piece. Mm -hmm. And then the other piece is um, we look for fit and use part of the contracting process mm -hmm. to determine if that's an easy or hard end organization to work with. Because what we find over time, what I found is if the vendor is difficult to get through an agreement with, oh. that's the best they're ever going to be. That's right, because they're still trying to please you and get your business and they're still Correct. giving you agita. Correct. And if that's hard... Mm -hmm. it's not going to get any easier once that contract is signed. And so I do use, and we do use the, the negotiation process as a, as a, as a filter. So now I've just given um, others uh, a window <laughs> into what we're doing with the contracting process. So we'll see how my next one plays out, but that does yeah. play into it. That's, you know, that is, that's a, that's a watching them behave, not listening to the words that they're saying. Right. So that's, that's a key piece. And then the other, and I think, you know, this is also and critically important is we use, we consume a lot of information. Mm-hmm. Um, from both industry feedback around technology, and there's a lot of there's a lot of organizations within healthcare that just rate technology vendors. Yes. Yep. So we, we we create a basket of those, so we don't just rely on a magic quadrant, or we don't just rely mm -hmm. on a best in class, but we create a basket and we get a composite score. Yeah. And so we use that composite mm. score to sift out and say we will only work with high composite score vendors. Yeah that are of a certain size and complexity or have a certain amount of funding and backing. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the other thing we look at kind of lastly is we're purposeful about when we partner with a startup mm -hmm. versus when we partner with an established player. And there's pros and cons of either. And we're yeah. pur purposeful and clear eyed on when we make that choice. Right. When I was thinking, it was reminding me as you were talking of an experience some years ago and I was, um, it was the probably gosh, it's probably more than a decade, but it was CIOs who had very carefully developed policies for how you could do business with their companies. And then there were, a, it was, this was in the biotech area too, and there were a number of really interesting startups and most of them couldn't pass the criteria. And it just, you know, they had to essentially come up with another set of criteria, which totally makes sense. But it apparently, you know, it could take months to kind of convince everybody that this could be worth it. So and nimble. And so that's a great yeah. point. And nimble is at the heart of everything we do. Yes. Over, over system, this funny pumpkin for me, but over systematizing the process <laughs> doesn't help. Okay. Under systematizing the process doesn't help either, but for different reasons. And so yeah. we're trying to be nimble in yeah. how we adjust. Um, but everyone knows what the rules are and what, yeah. the, what the boundaries are. Well, and it sounds overall like that it's just a little more open-minded. I mean, that probably comes from the listening and from getting other people weighing in on the process and so forth. Um, one of the other thing I wanted to ask you about around talent um, that, you you know, everybody's been going through the great resignation and the great uncertainty and all that. And you've had a certain amount of churn as well. But you also mentioned that you're able to re-recruit. And I wondered yeah. what kind of strategy for re-recruitment have you really found pay off? We've tried a lot. Um, <laughs> okay. We've, we've tried several. I only I want the good ones. I only yeah, want you to tell me the great ones. ones. The nuggets. 
Yeah. And, and re so I think it starts with identifying that that is a key phase. A key phase yeah. of our staffing strategy is the re-recruitment of our existing A players. Okay. And we're vocal about that. And mm -hmm. we say we're going to re-recruit, we're going to retain, and we're going to recruit new. Mm -hmm. um, so the re-recruitment is an area that we just pay particular attention to. So we, through our discussions and dialogues, management, cascading down into the staff, is we're constantly identifying the re-recruitment opportunities. Mm -hmm. And again, not telling, but listening. What is it that re-recruitment looks like for you? Yeah. What is it that you are looking for? Um, and then how can we align on your needs and what, what the needs of the organization are. And we've gotten some pretty novel approaches to that. I mean, we've been able to re-recruit people who want to relocate. Ah. And thought that they might not be able to relocate and stay with the, with the health system. And so we've been able to accommodate that. Oh, okay. And can't do that every time and can't do that in every situation, but there are certainly situations, especially now, mm -hmm. 2022, where a relocation and um, a, a telepresence or you know, remote work is, is a workable solution. And yes. So, but you get there through just actual honest feedback and mm -hmm. two-way dialogue. You have to create trust, right? Because the, the even putting myself in a certain situation, it takes a certain amount of trust to say, hey, I'm thinking about relocating or I'm mm -hmm. thinking about whatever, going back to school, whatever is the driver. Yeah. Um, it takes trust to reveal that. And then it takes talent to manage through the conversation and come up with a, a situation right. that is good for the organization and good for the, for the team member. Well, and I imagine that the team member, too, is probably a little surprised, sort of thinking, oh, I thought this was going to be a, I'm sorry to tell you this, but I'm leaving. So uh, re-recruitment means you're recruiting them again before they leave the organization. Okay, when you first said re-recruitment, yeah. I thought you meant they've already left somewhere else to see if the yeah. grass is greener and you're bringing them back, but that's not what uh, you mean. That yeah, we is really mean getting to them before they decide to leave. Okay, wow. that's got, I've heard that. Now, I haven't heard that particular strategy before, but a couple of times when I've asked CIOs, you know, what are you doing to uh, acquire and attract new talent? And they've said, well, I'm really, my number one focus is retention. And, you know, it just, that uh, that makes a lot more sense. I love that. You're probably going to, do you have any other secrets you want to give away on re-recruitment? Because <laughs> I think. I, I think I, those are the big nuggets. There's, okay. there's other ones, but I think that's the least, easily, most easily describable. Yeah, yeah. All right, good. Let me see. I want to, let me pivot over now to talk about um, everybody's favorite subject, innovation. You know, innovation ecosystems and any shifts in directions, new areas to explore. I mentioned that you've two years in a row brought home, your team has brought home a yeah. CIO 100 Innovation Award. Congratulations again on that. But when we talk, you uh, you actually told me a little bit about one of the submissions you made to the awards program that everybody thought would win but didn't, and it sounded really pretty interesting. I want you to talk about that. You developed a predictive math model, and the intention is to patent this, that yeah. is essentially predicting monthly profitability within 2% accuracy. And it's not just for IT, it's for the entire health center. Correct. Okay. Yeah. What can you tell us about that? Right? Well, understanding the patent may be pending. Yeah, understanding the patent is pending. Yeah. Um, and so we, can, we can probe there. But what we know is, so it's, everyone talks about how much patient data exists and how we can use yes. that patient data um, to find therapies and find what's successful. But we also have that on the revenue side as well mm -hmm. and on the expense side. And so what our CEO challenged us to come up with is what are, what are the data points that matter? in the mm -hmm. systems that we currently have, <clears throat> the data that we have, knowing that we have five, six, seven years of perfect historical information by day mm -hmm. on what our revenues were. Okay. And how can we take that perfect information and understand what drives those outcomes mm -hmm. and then measure those things going forward to predict what our revenue is going to be? And okay. so... This concept, this economic concept of time series, yeah, was the underpinning of the two models we created. So we create a leading model, which is we're looking at future things like appointments mm -hmm. in the future. So not in the past, but from tomorrow forward, how many appointments are already scheduled? And mm -hmm. as we get closer to that, <clears throat> that today, 
what's the ultimate number of appointments that get completed in that day? And we start comparing mm -hmm. how close do we think 100% of our appointment volume we're going to have we are. Yeah. And we can produce, we can predict volume changes six, seven months in advance by doing that. In, and so we can wow. see. And in healthcare, I mean, we're not yeah. talking about, this isn't like the stock market. You know, we're talking about right. people and their health issues. Correct. That's fascinating. It turns out that you health, you health, now there's some advantages to why you health can even do that. One of which mm -hmm. is we have not grown explosively through acquisition and m, &M. Okay. So we have a really, you know, we, we have grown well, we have grown large, mm -hmm. but to organic growth. Yeah. So you can trend that organic growth. And so we've been able to use that historic performance and then come and, and, and project forward from it. And it's, it is shocking. I will tell you, it's shockingly accurate. I really, <laughs> it's more accurate than I thought it would be when we started doing it. And that's on the prediction side for future appointments. And we can see whether that's being driven by vacations, mm -hmm. that volume increase or decrease. We can see if it's seasonality based upon when people come to Miami and when they, when they leave Miami. And so we've mm -hmm. been able to tease out some like really important things in terms of how much or how little impact the particular event we'll have in Miami mm -hmm. um, and how we might need to think about our staffing or availability. So that is on the future prediction side. And yeah. then on the, on the look back, on the using um, performance from the past to predict how our revenue is going to go in the, in, in the future, that is incredibly accurate because we know mm -hmm. uh, we got back to unit cost. We got down to the unit cost um, or the unit uh, revenue associated with activities, both what you think of as the doctor's office and then what you think of as in a hospital. And we mm -hmm. were able to come within 2% on the first day of the month within 2% of what the revenue for the month will be on the last day of the month. Wow. And does the introduction of so much more acceptance of the digital technologies to do all this, okay. that does that not skew the model in some way? It, so far it has not. We've been doing this since July of last year. Yeah. Wow. And um, no, it, it has not skewed. Um, what we did go through was like an adoption curve of these facts. Yeah. Um, and so we went through the, we went through the adoption of the, facts that, um, that feed into the prediction and there was some there were some rough patches where we were kind of having like a food fight over what facts matter and what facts are facts and how <laughs> and, um, mm -hmm. are those facts really facts or are they just statements and so we, we got yeah. through all that we matured as an organization and we've really begun to understand um, how our revenues are driven by uh, availability and okay. demand not just demand and it's not just availability it's the effusion of availability and demand wow that is really interesting stuff and it's a magnificent way to pivot into talking about your enterprise data strategy which is yeah. next on my list to ask about because you know everybody will tell you these days people are our greatest assets but right behind that is like how well you're managing and using data um, so talk about that, about, uh, I know that you recently, uh, you don't have just a chief data officer, you also have a chief data science leader. So tell us about the thinking behind that and what the enterprise strategy is now yeah. uh, for data. We, we create, and I created two positions and two teams mm -hmm. because there's just so much to do. Yeah. And what, what we were in now, that brings its own set of challenges, but what we were really focused on is how to create um, specific pathways and lots of capacity and capability to get through the work that needs to be done. And this mm -hmm. is not technical work, right? This is data definitions and data understanding, and right? Data socialization, and that's on the data side. And then on the on the data science side, it's then developing, taking the data, socializing artificial intelligence methods, socializing machine learning methods. Um, seeing what we can use off the shelf versus what we need to invent on our own. Mm -hmm. And it takes two leaders that work really well together on the data side and the data science side to be able to pull that strategy off. Okay. Um, but mm -hmm. what we see in the nine months that we've been functioning in this way is it's such an additive. The sum is way bigger than the individual parts are. And so we have created, but I want to say massive organizational excitement around both our research and data science mm -hmm. capability, as well as our data definitions, 
data reporting, business intelligence, and analysis functions. And so we've we've really opened up the funnel uh, to an extraordinary degree. Yeah. And did has this going on over the last nine months, has that played into the, you know, the patent pending model that you've developed? Yes. Yeah. That's... You couldn't have done this without, we couldn't have done okay. that level of prediction without adding those capabilities and creating the space to do it. Okay. Um, because the other thing is, you know, and it, it's kind of like no one asked Michelangelo how long was going to take to paint that church, right? Like there's there's a real creative process yeah. as well um, that goes with us. And I think that's often missed is mm -hmm. the, you know, spinning up a server, deploying a computer. We know how long that takes. Sure. Yeah. Inventing a predictive model. How long does invention take and how much work does that yeah. occupy? The other thing we found is it's such a creative process. We need to have people to bounce ideas off of. Mm -hmm. And so of uh, this or of uh, that doesn't spark the idea. And okay. it doesn't take the idea to the next level. You, you need a collective where there is some energy and there's ideas are built upon. Yes. And that is what created, you know, that's what, that's, that was the big bang that created the capability that we have now is it wasn't, we didn't under club it in the sense that we just got one of these and one of those and hope it all worked out. Mm -hmm. We hired seven, 10, 15 people, put them in clear roles yeah. with clear definitions of what there is their scope and then said, you know, go forward and see what you can come up with. Yes. Wow. I mean, that feels like the way innovation ought to be done, um, probably because it's so many different ways have tried. I remember a, a professor and a lecturer that I have admired for a long time at UCLA, um, Moshe Rubinstein. He's written books about this sort of thing. And the one thing he said that has always stuck with me is he said, creativity comes from conversation. And as somebody who loves having a good conversation, I've just always clung to that. But I think that it, it really makes a big difference, too, with really smart, talented technology people to have not only a clear definition, but to be told this is a greenfield area as well. You know, what can you come up with? Yeah. That's, you know, kudos to you. Well done. <laughs> um, let's talk next about crypto. I asked about cryptocurrency, just kind of, I had it on my list, and I was like, well, you know, any emerging tech trends of greater interest to you, and I threw crypto out there, and you lit right up. Crypto's a big deal where you are. Talk, talk about that. I, I, was, I was surprised. I did not suspect that. Crypto is a big deal in Miami. I think Miami likes to position itself as the crypto capital of America, and I'm, I'm uh, looking at the arena, the FTX arena right now, uh, yeah. downtown Miami, where the Miami Heat play, mm -hmm. um, which is branded after a cryptocurrency exchange, and the, the Formula One race, which is coming to Miami right. um, later in the beginning of May, is sponsored by Crypto.com. So, um, And the city of Miami has its own cryptocurrency. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we're increasingly within the University of Miami community taking um, crypto or alternative payment methods um, and, and transacting in them, in particular NFTs. Mm -hmm. And what we're looking at now is, I, I predict, certainly in places like Miami and perhaps others, it is not going to be too much longer before people want to pay for their care right. with a cryptocurrency. And so that's what we're really trying to make sure that we... we, we create the technical capability now to receive payment yeah. that way. And we have to make sure that we're well within the laws and regulations and the challenges that that will bring. Yeah. But at the same time, I think we, we can't be naive to think that it's not going to happen. It's going to happen probably sooner than we expect. Okay. What is involved for the technology organization in creating a capability for that? You're, essentially, you're getting ready to commence to begin something that hasn't started yet. So, yeah, exactly. uh, yeah. so how do you do that? Does that become uh, you know, a subset of one of your data science teams that looks into it? How do you approach it? Yeah, I mean, we have to, there's a series of, I think there's a series of teams and disciplines from information security to data science to our revenue cycle teams, mm -hmm. um, where, and then our legal teams to make sure that we, we fully understand the issue, which sounds interesting, right? Like it sounds like how hard can it be, but it, to really fully understand <laughs> mm -hmm. the issue, make sure that we aren't missing something. 
Uh, and we're really kind of leading that from a revenue cycle standpoint. So we're saying that the revenue cycle for the health system is, is the matter of what we would do this. And so mm-hmm. the revenue cycle technology teams are leading the charge to create the technology yeah. through our partners that can receive these advanced and alternate forms of care. Okay. Well, and I feel like it would really be remiss of me if I were not to ask you about doing the CIO job, especially where you are and what you're doing now with all of that CSO background of yours. Before you got into the CIO world, you were a chief security officer for a number of years. So you bring a mindset to being a CIO that is fairly, it's unique. It's, you don't run into it all that often. How does, how does that help you as a CIO? What does that, how does that fuel your Decision making. Uh, it doesn't make you too security conscious, so that you don't sound like a CIO who's shutting down and locking all the doors. So, uh, talk about that a little bit about how that has kind of informed your approach to being the chief information officer. I think it's helped me get to yes. Oh, okay. Um, because what I and I, I tried to do this when I was a security officer, and I, I certainly tried to do this in CIO roles. Is mm-hmm. you can use security as a way to say no. But that's easy. Yes. And what I've what I really always tried to do is say I have spent a lot of time dealing with security matters, who understand security well, really understand it in um, banking as well as in, in healthcare. And how do we capitalize on that to get to yes? Okay. How do we do this thing in a safe way? Do this do this new initiative in a way that doesn't create any risk? Mm-hmm. Um, and and we get to yes. And I think that's what it's really helped me do is do things faster. Mm-hmm because I just innately know where those security challenges will be. All right. And we can plan for that up front. Okay. And we can address that at the very beginning oh. and bake those mitigations and those solutions in up front mm-hmm. so that they're not packed on at the afterthought when people start asking questions and start getting nervous. And so I think it's really helped us get things done quicker yeah. and push the boundary. In, well, a, in a safe, in a safe way. Yeah. Well, it's interesting too because that that sort of mindset, the bake security in at the beginning, you hear that a lot as a piece of advice about here's how applications should be developed and so forth. But then you feel like you know it might be people that don't have any CSO or security background who think, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, we've got that. We've got that on our list. But mm-hmm. it, it essentially, you've been able to make it part of the way your team is thinking about these things. Yeah, yeah, and functions, and then security is able to do a function, but yes, it's front, and it's just a part of a requirement. Okay, uh, it's not tacked on at the end. Yeah, do you have? And I know that um, systemic managing systemic risk is something that you think about, and you have a lot of expertise in. Um, is that um, more of a how, how many alarms of a fire is that for you these days? You know, when you think about all the cyber, cyber crime that happens about the systemic risk, especially for not just utilities, but healthcare systems. Uh, what can you tell us about that? I know some of it you probably can't and won't talk about, but what, right. what would you want to say about it? What I would want to say is the systemic, and you know, and now I'm waxing philosophically, but mm-hmm. if the systemic risk is real. Mm-hmm. And... The risk doesn't come from that, like my, you know, uh, the the things you see in the movies about these really obtuse, kind of high abstract, complicated hacking through multiple technologies. It just happens through social engineering and yeah. getting the user to click on the wrong thing at the wrong time. Um, and that, in many respects, is much more difficult because mm-hmm. when you think about managing systemic risk it's every stakeholder interacting with your digital technology is to do the right thing every time mm, which is is impossible people do just, right <laughs> people do or just has to be right once yeah to establish the foothold they need and then, so that's one the other the other thing i would say is you know sun Tzu shares with us about underestimate your enemy at your own peril and our digital foes mm-hmm. are sophisticated yes and um, I think happy to go into it any more detail than that, but I would leave it there. Okay. Nope. That's that's plenty good enough. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, wrap up question for you here. Uh, what has the pandemic 
taught you as a leader changed in you as the way you lead your teams? Yeah, that's uh, it's another great question. I, I think um, more than anything, I've always had a pretty high IQ or EQ. I mm-hmm. say. My EQ has always been something I, I listened to quite a bit. I think the pandemic really taught me to how to use that EQ in different ways. We don't have, mm. it's harder to hear tone through mm-hmm. Zoom. And sometimes you can see nonverbal body language through Zoom. Sometimes you can't. Yeah. Um, and so I've, I've, I've learned to kind of even tune into things more deeply. Mm-hmm. Um, and at the same time, really ask more questions. And I, I think mm-hmm. that's the challenge more than anything is what we've begun to learn. And we're not there yet is how to listen better through a telepresence session yeah. rather than just in the room. Okay. Fair. And that would be a very useful skill to have these days and probably one that everybody can keep improving all the time. Right. All right. Wonderful. It's been such a great conversation having you here today. Thank you so much for joining. It was Thank really it was really great talking to you again, David, and congratulations on all your success there. Thank you so much. And are you sure you don't want to ever come back to New England and have we had snow just last week? <laughs> <laughs> don't miss it okay all right thank you so much thank you and thank you uh, for joining us our audience out there if you joined us late into this um conversation don't don't despair it will be here on linkedin for several more hours today and then also on cio.com and you can find it on you our youtube channel which is called tech talk CIO Leadership Live is also available as an audio podcast wherever you find your podcasts. And I hope you enjoyed this conversation with CIO David Reese of the University of Miami Health System as much as I did, and that you'll join me again back here on Wednesday, May 4th, when we will have CIO Paul Beswick of Marsh McLennan as our guest. We really appreciate you joining us today, so please do take a moment to subscribe to that YouTube channel, IDG Tech Talk, where you can find all of the previous episodes of CIO Leadership Live, and they number more than 80 now, so I keep promoting them as a great way to binge your way through a long weekend. (laughs) Stay well, and we'll see you back here next time. Thanks so much.